take a look at this motherboard because you can probably get this on a discount right now and it has a lot of great features, a great voltage regulator, and it's totally loaded for overclocking. First we're going to do the complimentary or, you know, I have to do it, the unboxing because everyone loves that stuff. Uh, so let's take a look because this has some of the most unique packaging uh, that I've ever seen from a Gigabyte or actually any motherboard. And it comes with something really cool inside that I actually kind of use on my phone, but you can definitely use with your case. So we open the box, everything's high quality, t might fight on, um, and then the motherboard comes in a little anti-static foam enclosure, and it does have an anti-static top to it. Now you can just take the top off, take the motherboard out, but we're going to look at the motherboard in a little bit, because right now we're going to look at accessories. Wow, that's heavy. Alright, so you get stickers, put them on your passport, put them on your case, put them on whatever you want. These are cable stickers so you can like keep track of what cables come from where and where they go. So this is SATA 1, SATA 2, you know, that kind of stuff. Although most of you, I believe, will probably be using M.2 instead of SATA. So we got those. Here we get the normal... You got your manuals. I love my manuals. You all learn that because you learn so much from the manuals. I mean, where else are you going to get a block diagram of the motherboard from, right? Let's be honest. And then, in here, we get a couple other surprises. So you get uh, two Velcro cable ties. They say Oris on them. Typical cable ties for large bundles of cables. Not bad. Nice inclusion. We get a, a G connector. I know, I've already opened this. Uh, I already did a written review. You can go to stevesharder.com and you can, you can see everything with nice pictures. Uh, so basically, you just feed your cables into here and then you plug that into, actually this motherboard has an extension for it because it comes out at a right angle, we'll talk about that later but this helps organize and put all your front cable headers together now we get this, oh, this is the wrong box <laughs> but here's the beautiful part this is an Oris USB stick, so instead of a DVD I, I, don't, I have like one DVD drive and I use it to replay episodes of The Office because I own the box set and I didn't want to play for Peacock so, <laughs> USB is much better for drivers and software than anything else. Now, this uh, has all your drivers and software to basically get your system up and running. Now, Windows 10 by default does not have drivers for the Ethernet connections on this motherboard. You have a 5 gigabit, or 2.5 gigabit, sorry, from Intel, and you have a 10 gigabit from Acquainta. Neither of those are included in the basic Windows 10. Now, I don't know about Windows 11, because that's coming out next week. And you can also go and, like, bootleg it and get it now, but... I would just wait till next week. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Be cool if it did. This goes to something else, and I guess it will take out something really cool. This is the Essential USB DAC. This thing will take apart with a thermal camera later because it's glued in there, and I want to melt it and not like melt the plastic or whatever kind of whatever this is material, some kind of concoction. Anyways, it goes into a Type C header. And then there's a DAC inside of here with the audio processor and nice capacitors and really good filtering. So the signal comes out to a 3.5 millimeter jack. Now I use an S10, uh, well actually no, I have an S21 uh, Samsung and uh, it doesn't have the headphone jack. So I actually tried plugging this in to that phone and it worked. And the audio was pretty good. Um, I'm not an audiophile but this should probably be a lot better than what comes out of your front audio port. Although this motherboard does have two separate controllers to ensure that audio is good in the back and the front and it's above and beyond other motherboards in this range. Uh, but this is pretty cool, pretty durable. You can use it on your phone, use it on your cases, USB Type-C, whatever. And this motherboard does have some nice Type-C headers. This is, a, I think, the disclaimer for that. Whatever. Anyways, what is this? It's like a bunch of goodies. Okay, so these are extension cords because the motherboard has right angle connectors, which is not typical. So they basically condensed uh, the headers for the front panel into this. You plug this into the side of the motherboard and then you plug your front panel in here. Like this G connector would go into here, okay? Yeah, whatever, here, like that. Uh, you plug your jumpers into here when you're building the computer and then you plug them into here. This goes in the motherboard. And then boom, you have your power, star, HDD, whatever, system, status, LEDs. This uh, expands uh, USB 2.0 out to two headers. Now, USB 2.0 is kind of outdated, but the fact of the matter is a lot of water coolers, they use it. And so do a lot of uh, third-party accessories, because they don't need the bandwidth of USB 3.0. You only have like one or two headers on a motherboard, so people tend to fall back on USB 2.0. 
However, a lot of the chipsets don't support a lot of USB 2.0. So everyone in lieu goes to USB 3.0, but the fact of the matter is, this comes with the motherboard, you got two internal, and then you got a bunch in the back as well. Um, both come from a hub, and we'll cover that later when we look at the board. Now we'll look at the Wi-Fi. Now, I believe this is the AX201 uh, wireless AC. So you have uh, two sets of antenna here. Now this is the latest and greatest in what is offered. Now these I have not like peeled stuff off. I know people like that, so why not? <laughs> I don't get that. Anyways, so here's your art Oris things. Um, I believe these are magnetic on the bottom. You know what? Why not? Don't worry if you didn't get it. I got another. I think I should become a hand model. <laughs> And we got more here later on if anyone wants to see. I'll do a follow-up video. Now we got our RGB. Now everyone loves RGB. And here's what I don't understand. Um, Why well, you need extension cables? But I guess a lot of RGB is kind of short and it's better not to use a soldering iron on a technology you don't understand or maybe use the wrong cable or something. But I'm pretty sure most people could just solder this. Anyways, so you got connectors here. This expends to normal RGB, so you have RGB. So the LEDs are not addressable, so they all work at the same, like, they pulse at the same rate and the same color. But I mean, that's okay. A lot of people like that. So that's that. And then you have two others. Actually, I think you have two of those. Same thing here. RGB. Extension. Not a bad thing to have, actually, on hand. I have a bunch of them. Now, this is addressable RGB, and uh, here's the thing. So this will plug into your motherboard. And this will go into something else. Um, I believe who uses this is actually Corsair which is one of the largest brands in terms of RGB stuff. And uh, they use a three pin like this, Gigabyte used to, but the fact of the matter is all of the manufacturers uh, hedge their bet on this, other than Gigabyte. So Gigabyte's getting with the game, providing uh, converters and stuff like that. Um, not a bad idea, because they used to have three pins, but now they move to this four pin style, just like Asus, ASRock, and MSI. Now here's the funny thing I didn't notice when I first got this motherboard. There's still crap underneath here. This is an audio sensor cable. So you plug this in your motherboard and it'll give you a decibel out reading. Um, and it, I did have this question when I was in the briefing at Computex. And I was sitting in one of their rooms in their headquarters and I was like, wait, so you want people to install microphones on their motherboards? And they were like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, so how do they know it's not recording what they say? I mean, it's always on, it's always listening. And they're like, no, we just look for static ambient noise um, from fans. And plus this thing's so small, and if it's in your case, it probably can't hear anything anyways. Um, so you use this as a decibel meter. Uh, so if your uh, your fans are too loud, it'll turn them down if you want. I mean, it's not required. So These are temperature sensors. Uh, you plug them into the EC ports on the motherboard. That's an embedded controller uh, that basically takes in temperature readings. And then what it will do is relay those temperature readings as reference points to your fan curve. Uh, so you can use this plus the audio. And you can basically stabilize everything. Uh, you can use audio plus temperature to stabilize your fans. And those are really the only two things you need to stabilize a fan. And this one comes out too. I think. Oh, thank God it did. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Six SATA cables. Um, there are six SATA ports on the motherboard, so you can have up to six drives. However, I will say right now, there are a bunch of, uh, well, one of the M.2 ports shares ports with two of the SATA ports. Um, and there's a lot of sharing going on this motherboard. The PCH is responsible for that. But these are, uh, well, this is braided, this is braided, and this is braided. That's pretty high quality. Braided SATA cables are pretty important because... To be honest, I don't think you can really buy them that easily, and they are expensive. Gigabyte gives you six of them. More Velcro strips. Actually, forget the Velcro strips I showed you before. These are Velcro strips. I don't know if there's another here. I hope there's another. All right. So now let's take care of the board. Alright, 
Here we have two 8-pin connectors. Now each of these are rated for about 300 watts. These are reinforced uh, with aluminum shielding on them and that's basically for solidarity with the PCB. When the PCB is very thick here and it's double copper and it's also an extra low impedance PCB. Meaning it's better for DRAM uh, communication but also it improves everything else. Well the copper definitely helps with thermals and it definitely helps with power conductivity. Now we do have a system fan header here and please Hold on while we cover the other seven fan headers. <laughs> there are way too many on this motherboard. So we got two here, one here, and one here. These are for the CPU and the CPU optional. Um, here you have a postcode display. Now the postcode display will give you codes to diagnose the motherboard in case something doesn't boot. Uh, when it says AB, you're in the BIOS. When it says 99, you're hanging on an IED device like a keyboard or mouse. Um, 51. Uh, memory, zero, zero, you're screwed because the CPU is done. Uh, this is OC Ignition. OC Ignition is great for custom water coolers. If you hit this button and you just plug in power, it'll give power to all the fan headers and all everything and just needs power to the motherboard, but not actually system. So you can actually power up your water cooling system, see if there's any leaks or something like that. But if you're in liquid nitrogen and you're doing liquid nitrogen cooling, sometimes you need the system to cool down a little bit so no condensation happens, and for that you need the fans to run, and that's what OC Ignition was actually built for. These are EC1, EC2 headers. Those uh, thermal temperature probes we showed you easily earlier, sorry, earlier, uh, they're here and here. Uh, so you plug them in there, the cables are long, so you can go to the front, you can go to the back, up, down, left, right, I don't know all the dimensions. Anyways, so you go a uh, power, restart button here, and then here you have other stuff. All right, and now moving on, we have these right angled headers. So here we have five system fan headers. Two of them are pump headers. They run at full speed by default and that's their purpose because pumps really, I mean, most of the time you just want them running at full speed. They shouldn't really be too loud unless they're poor quality. Otherwise maybe they're just like, I don't know, really powerful. Um, and in that case you can actually turn down the speeds. All the fan headers in this motherboard are hybrid PWM slash voltage mode headers. So if they're three pin or four pin you can control both of them. Then you have your 24 pin header, which is right angled, which a lot of people love because for aesthetics, it's preferable. And as you can see, it's tucked in a little bit. So you can plug it in and then pull it down, especially if you get those like uh, individually braided cables uh, with a you know, cable comb. Then you have one of these specialty headers here, and there's another one over here. And uh, these headers, they basically are for USB and front panel headers. And uh, they basically, they come with the cables in the box like I showed you earlier. And you can basically extend them and put them behind the case. This is basically made for optimum aesthetics. So you take your front panel, you take your USB 2.0, you take them behind and you plug them in there uh, with the extension cables. Now uh, here, oh wait, you also have two headers here. Now one of them is for addressable, one of them is for normal RGB. And you have extension cables for those also included with the motherboard. This is for your audio sensor. Now it's shorted out with a little jumper here. This jumper keeps it shorted out on purpose uh, because jumper just basically you know, shorts it. So it's not gonna hurt the circuit, but uh, the audio tests resistance and the resistance comes back to the motherboard and tells it what the audio sensor is seeing or reading in decibels. So that's important, but you just remove this, plug in your audio sensor, and then you have the audio capability, which I think you use through a system information viewer. Uh, yeah, and then you have uh, six SATA ports here, uh, USB 3.0, and uh, USB 3.0 is great for, you know, most things. Most cases have internal audio for USB 3.0. Six SATA here, and I did tell you that some of them were shared. Later on, when we take apart the motherboard, it's a lot easier for you to see what is shared and what is not than me doing it right now, right here. Uh, so we have those headers, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Oh, and uh, two extra sets of <laughs> RGB headers. <laughs> this motherboard is not short on RGB. Not at all. But everything is on this side of the motherboard on purpose. Because Gigabyte is thinking that everyone is just going to put their cables over here. Now, I'm not sure if that's sure for your case or, like, really going to work on your case. But, like, hopefully it will. Uh, so let's move on to another part of the motherboard. All right, so this is the part you all have been waiting for. But, of course, it needs to start with me taking it apart. I think the first thing I'm going to do, this, 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 this. So you got four screws here. And they're responsible for the M.2 drives. And 
and uh, they do need like a tiny little screwdriver. And you might want to put these screws aside because um, they're really tiny. Uh, so are all M.2 screws. M.2 screws. I'm not going to screw that right. This first M.2 slot is to the CPU. But when the CPU does not support PCI 4.0, because when it does, it'll straight go to the CPU. When it does not support PCI 4.0, which the 11th gen do, if you put the 10th gen CPU in here, it only supports PCI 3.0, but it won't go to this slot. It'll go to the PCH just like, you know, any other Gen 10. Um, there is a heatsink here, so you peel this off like this, and you have your thermal pads here. And you have a thermal pad here for the bottom, which you really don't need, but it's nice they, uh, you know, include. So that's there. And now you have uh, other screws here. Um, on a motherboard with this kind of aesthetic, you're going to have to unscrew some of these screws to get to the M.2 slots, which are kind of like the money on the motherboard when it comes to storage. And if you're going to have storage that's like high-end, like a really nice NVMe drive, and you want to use that like a uh, direct storage that's in uh, you know, the new uh, OS in Windows 11, you're going to want to use M.2 because um, M.2 supports NVMe and uh, SATA does not. So those right angle connectors here do not, sadly. Well, not sadly, I mean, SATA is limited at 6 gigabits per second. Uh, even on Gen <laughs> on Gen 3, they're 32 gigabits per second. On Gen 4, they're 64 gigabits per second. So there's a huge differential there. So we can take this whole thing off. <clears throat> Beautiful. So this also has two. So this motherboard has three M.2 slots. Now these and these go to the CPU or the PCH, the Platform Controller Hub. And uh, that connects to the CPU here by DMI 4.0. Now, the one big difference between this and a Z590 board is Z590 has by 8 connection between these two. Um, but that shouldn't make a difference if you're using 11th gen, and you can definitely use 11th gen in this. Uh, and it'll just go straight here, and I don't, you might be able to saturate the DMI with these two working at full speed, but, I mean, no one ever does that. Anyways, so these are here. That's done on this side, and now we got to reverse the board on the other side, take the screws off. Usually on a Gigabyte motherboard, well, you have to do some prep work. On a Gigabyte motherboard, you really, um, usually you have to release two screws in the upper half of the board to basically be able to, you know, remove everything off the board. And it's not a little endeavor. It's actually really, really kind of confusing. They're all types of screws, and they're all different. You have an integrated I.O. here, you have the VRM heat sinks, you have the back shield here. Now this back shield keeps the motherboard stay straight, the PCB. So let's say you have it in a case or you have it on a freestanding bench and you do put in a graphics card. Sometimes a graphics card is really heavy. Even like a RTX 2080 Ti is really heavy. And it'll cause like a little droop in this area of the board. Not with the back shield. Okay, the back shield stabilizes everything to its maximum. That's why Gigabyte puts it on its high end and its board higher end boards. But the fact of the matter is, um, not only this Gigabyte motherboard for Z490 or Z5, Z590 has a back shield. They all have back shields. Well, not all of them, but the high end ones. Mostly everything over $300 has one. But you see the screws, one, two, three, and so on. So we're just going to take them off as if, uh, you know, as if it's no big deal. Now, I highly do not recommend this. This is why I'm doing this right now, so you don't have to do this. Um, I will tell you, it's not easy putting it back together. Now, if you do that, you can get one of those iFixit uh, little, like, screw holders. Technically, uh, I use little plates that are disposable. <laughs> I put the screws in there. Um, now, you got to be careful, okay? So this, 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 uh, you never know what goes in the VRMs. Obviously, this goes in the VRMs. This probably goes into it. This does, too. And I think this might too. However, you got to keep track of screws like this because they might go uh, way further in. No, this one does not. This goes into a standoff that goes into it. And then we're going to do a bunch of standoffs. And when we deal with the standoffs, we're going to have to deal with, uh, well, you can't screw off a standoff with a screwdriver. You need some pliers. Now, you see these are all the same height, or these screws are the same height. So the fact of the matter is we're going to have to use pliers, and we're going to have to remember that these go into the back of the motherboard. These keep on the rear I.O. shield that's integrated. Uh, these keep on the audio. And you see this here? This is a neck relay. And this relay is not con 
like covered. The Relight keeps an anti-pop system, so when you boot up, there's no big pop when you load up Windows. It's cute, but then it kind of sounds like your motherboard's going off like a bomb. Like a little tick tick. Um, it's not a big deal. It's just something higher-end boards do. Gigabyte uses it, uh, Asus uses it, and I think MSI might have used it in the past. It's, uh, it's not a bad feature. It works. There's no pop. Anyways, so now this is going to come off, but when this comes off, uh, you can see the thermal pads on the back side. So Gigabyte's... Oh, sorry, I got a... I got a little text message, but you guys are more important. Anyways, so here we have a little uh, thermal pad here, and you see that the thermal pad um, has basically uh, embedded into the circuits. And you see the outline, and that's what you want to see. You want to see that this... Oh my god. You want to see that the circuits are actually showing up. Um, because that's important. Because that means it's embedded into the product and it's actually going on more than one side. So when the circuit goes in there and the capacitor or the resistors goes in there, it needs to hit the actual PCB. And this means it's getting past that and actually hitting the PCB on the flat side. And the flat side should leave no uh, mark. This is for cooling down the A10, uh, AQC107 10 gigabit controller. The thing is, it gets a little hot, uh, especially when you use it. Anyway, so it's... It's a pretty solid piece of metal. I'll put this aside for now. Okay, now we have the back of the motherboard. Here we can see the voltage regulator circuit. These little tiny chips that are embedded, these are doublers. Uh, these chips here, these are POS capacitors. Um, POS capacitor, POS capacitor. Um, they're POS caps. They're made by Panasonic, and they're solid state tantalium based. Now they're great. Their ESR is not solely awesome, but they're great at high frequency reduction. Um, but they're, they're pretty good and used in conjunction with electrolytic or non-electrolytic polymer capacitors that basically look like electrolytics. Uh, they do their job really well. But now you see we have all these standoffs. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, not that. We don't have to worry about that. Six, seven, eight. So we got to take these off. Um, some of these, I've already taken this board apart. Some of these you can just like unscrew. This goes into the CPU VRM and you can see it's threaded and it's not threaded like it goes in the plastic. Uh, some of them are, so you got to be careful about that, and you got to know where it is if you're going to do this. So I'm just using my fingers. Uh, first thing you might do is not going to go on your fingers. Okay, you guys are still more important. Anyways, so we're going to go and do this. Don't read it. <laughs> Don't zoom in on that, dude. Anyways, so we got more. Oh, thank God, they're all threaded. Oh, I totally forgot. It's all metal, so that makes sense. Okay, another one. Metal. So if it's not metal threaded, it's going to look like a screw, like what goes in a wall or something. It's going to be pointy at the end. This one actually might need a... Oh, I can't do it with my finger, but it's okay. I'll do that in a second. Okay, so these go to your PCH heat sink. These four. Now, when you're releasing the PCH heat sink, you want to be careful. So you want to go one side halfway, and then the opposite diagonal side halfway. This releases pressure on both ends, so you don't crack it, because it's just a bare die. It's how CPUs used to be, but that's not how they are anymore. They have the integrated heat spreader, so people are doing it wrong all the time. Don't kill their hardware. Now, I prefer undoing screws with my fingers whenever I can. Um, I feel like it's a more holistic way, but I'm not really into that stuff. However, in this case, when you talk about pressures on a little silicon die, it's probably the way to go. When you're doing with something fragile. The VRM heat sinks. These should be screwed in pretty tight. Um, the pressure on them is very important, and they do use a special heat spreader and a special uh, thermal pad. Um, it's pink. It's expensive, and this motherboard uses it. I'm popular tonight. What is it? Saturday, right? <laughs> Never mind. Okay, and then this one probably goes to the back I.O. Uh, connector. Yes, it has a magnetic tip in case anyone's warning. Okay, so then all we have to do is undo this one. One second, ladies and gents. Stop throwing stuff at me. 
I didn't ask you to throw that at me. <laughs> Anyways. It's so, okay, so this one's coming out. It's best to have fun when you're doing stuff like this. It's quite technical, but, you know, have some fun. Oh, I can redo this. Okay, now when I open this up and I'm going to flip it over, everything's going to fall apart. Well, kind of. Some of it won't because of the adhesion, but a lot of it will. <sighs> This is the metal piece that covers this area. Um, aluminum. It's a nice piece of analyzed aluminum, and now we can see it's actually labeled as to what everything is. So we'll put that aside as well. PCA heat sink. It comes off, but it has a little uh, RGB header here. Now we take that off, and then we see that this was covering the PCH. This is your Z470 PCH, a little piece of silicon die. This controls your entire motherboard, okay? And it's going to basically screw in four ways, and that's why we were so gentle with it. Because too much on one end will crack one of the edges of this little square silicon die. Now, this is about the size of, actually, what CPUs used to be. Um, now they're a bit bigger, but, I mean, it's pretty good. Uh, we'll go over the chips in a second, but I just want to show you this heatsink. This entire thing is used to cool this, as well as taking heat from these three M.2s if needed. You can see the RGB strip here, and this is where this plugs in. So if you do unplug this, make sure you plug it back in here or here with the correct polarity. And also, if you're pushing too hard to go in, your polarity is incorrect. There's only one way this wire goes into that little connector. Now, moving on. Pull up a little bit, a little bit of force. Oh, we gotta take this off first. Okay, so this is our back I.O. shield. There we go. Okay. So this is our uh, I.O. This little thing is metal too. Like, this is one of the first all metal motherboards I've dealt with. Well, not the first. It's one of the few, less than a handful, of all metal I.O. shields I've dealt with. And it's great. It doesn't cool anything, but I mean, it's kind of cool. <laughs> but anyways, uh, you got to remember to unplug this and replug it in as well. Otherwise, you'll use you'll lose the RGB effect here, which is actually one of the things people pay for in this motherboard, right? If you're paying so much, you might as well look pretty, like a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something nice. Anyways, uh, rear I/O shield uh, grounded, uh, so all the ports hit this. Screws in the motherboard, but also you screw in the motherboard in the case so it grounds it. Here's the money shot. So I'm keeping this on. Yep, one screw I forgot. So, as I said before, anytime you have too much tug on something, something's off. And it's this little screw here. All the screws are different sizes, it gets a little confusing after a while. There we go, it just came off on its own. Now you can see the beautiful voltage regulator module, and you can see the heat pads that we're keeping in place. Or cooling it. I'll correct this later. Um, but yeah, so basically, this is a very expensive thermal pad. I mean, you can put it back on. The oil from my hand probably doesn't help it at all, like at all. Um, but I mean, if you just fill the gaps, it's kind of like clay. However, yeah, I'm just going to leave that on. Anyways, so these are perfectly imprinted onto the chips that they cool. Now, this is total copper, direct touch, uh, direct touch heat pipe. You can see here, the copper, direct touch. It's basically in line with the aluminum here. And it will basically directly go through the thermal pads, which are totally required. You can't just put metal on ceramic or plastic or whatever is used for the coating of these. These are very high-end chips. I believe they're rated on 90 amps, which is insane. Anyway, so you got one heat pipe here, then you got another here for the heat sinks, and the heat sinks are all copper. Now they have been coated, uh, however, it should work excellent. Plus, there's an extra heat sink here, just for the AQC uh, 107, which this is overkill for an AQC 107. So this is also connected to the major heat pipe, so it will counterbalance if it overheats. And that is all you need to know about this heat sink. But I will say this is. Gigabyte should be proud of this. Now we go to the motherboard, and we see everything's on here. Underneath here, there is something, but I'm not going to take it off and show you right now. 
these are where the PCI 4.0 components are. If you want to see it, I did do a teardown on this motherboard on steveshardware.com. It's one of the recent reviews, so go check it out. And there are pictures of what's underneath here. PCI hold hardware uh, redriver switches, stuff like that. Well, actually, I believe uh, switches and then redrivers. We'll figure it out in a second when I do the entire overview of the motherboard. But here is the entire motherboard in its beauty. It is now nude, and it is ready for what rhymes with that. Um, yeah. yeah, it's ready for duty. And uh, we're going to take a look at it, tear it apart, and don't worry, we'll take a look at the back. Because here we have one uh, ALC 1220, and if we didn't look at the back, we might actually miss the second one. So we're going to go an overview in one second. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the part you've probably been waiting for, which I... I mean, I know my low of ears. You've been waiting for this. Anyways, so we have a huge voltage regulator over here. All right. Now this voltage regulator is um, is different than most voltage regulators. This one is Gigabyte's latest and greatest, and they did put it on their Z490 board. However, it is way overdone for Comet Lake CPUs and Rocket Lake for that matter, which is the newest generation. Now Gigabyte did their best to make sure this motherboard fully supports Rocket Lake. Now Rocket Lake does have one thing that's different than uh, Comet Lake and that is a DMI uh, bus but that shouldn't be affected too much by this because if you do put the new CPU in then you will get the new uh, PCI 4.0 capabilities which also includes uh, by 4 PCI 4.0 to the first M.2 slot. Now as you've noticed I've taken the heat sinks off the bottom heat sinks on the M.2 slots because I want to show you some of the circuits that are just hidden under there. But the first part is, I mean, everyone wants to know what the voltage regulator is about here, okay? We have a bunch of circuits here. It's a 16 phase just for the CPU power. There are eight ISL 6617s on the back. Those are phase doublers uh, with current sensing. Now, these are smart power stages, and they're rated up to 90 amps a pop. Now, if you know Ohm's law, Ohm's law is P equals IV, which is power equals, uh, you know, current times voltage. And that's in a pure ohmic circuit, but we can use it for a rough calculation here. Now, 90 amps. 90 amps is how much you need to run that CPU at default. And each one of these power stages can do it. And they can all fire at the same time. And that's due to the new digital PWM from Intersil, which is the ISL 69269. And this PWM is actually really, really interesting. So it is a... Uh, X plus Y plus Z. It has three different power rails. So you can control it or you can command it to do three different power rails, which it is doing here. And in this case, it's a uh, 12 plus one, uh, plus one, I believe. So you got one for the, you know, iGPU. And you can see the inductor down here has numbers on it on top. That's the iGPU power rail. And then here you have a smart power stage. It's also 90 amps, but it's off a little bit. That's for the VCSA. And then you have a two-face here of those little mini end packs, which is, I don't know why they do it. Maybe it's cheaper. Um, but that's off a separate controller, or maybe a linear controller, because no one really cares about VCIO these days. Anyway, so the CPU power is superior. And also, this PCB does have double copper, which means hopefully two ounces. It's also ultra low impedance PCB, which means that they actually paid extra to make sure there's, like when they do the actual PCB making with the resin and the copper layers and everything, they make sure there's no like air gaps or their gaps or there's too much resin someplace and that causes issues with signaling. And that's not for CPU power, that's for mostly memory, but the extra copper and the quality of the PCB improves the thermals and eventually the performance of the voltage regulators. So these are 90 amp uh, smart power stages and they are the ISL 99390. Um, 90 amps is overkill, but in the large perspective, you're overclocked this thing 24 seven for 10 years, the motherboard would probably last, while it wouldn't on something else. I don't know if you wanna run a system for 10 years, but if you do, this motherboard has you good. Anyways, so we'll move up a little bit over the Thunderbolt stuff. And I got my handy dandy camera guy. And I got a guy to do commentary. But... <laughs> Alright, so on this we have a, a bunch of crap. Uh, we have a, a JHL, I believe it's a, a 7546, and this is a Thunderbolt 3.0 controller. I believe it's the latest generation before we moved to Thunderbolt 4. Thunderbolt 4, however, I mean, there are no accessories for it or anything. It's way in its infancy. You want to wait a little bit on that. But Thunderbolt 3 has a large ecosystem of components. 
Now it has those, and it's using the Intel specification. And you know how? I know, because you're using the really expensive Texas Instruments switch chips for the Type-C ports on the back that we showed you earlier. Now these are TPS uh, 65983. Now the TPS chips, they handle power delivery, they handle everything. Um, they're just really great chips, but they're also really expensive. However, Gigabyte is following Intel specifications because these are specifically mentioned within those specifications for all Thunderbolt 3. And they basically provide power delivery. I don't know if it provides up to 100 watts over cable because I don't know how many cables can handle 100 watts that are that thin. But um, it does have the latest and greatest. Here we have a wireless AX controller. Um, I believe it's AX201. We also have our NICs, um, our network interface controllers. So we have an ALC or AQC107, a Quainta. It should be here somewhere. Look. Okay, let's put the board down. Can you focus on this? All right, so we got a Thunderbolt under control. Here are two Type-C controllers. Here's this, and we have a level shifter here for the USB on the back because uh, DisplayPort is a native, you know, the CPU outputs DisplayPort digital video as they call it and then it goes through this and it turns to HDMI because HDMI is I mean it's more common anyways here's our NICs so we have AQC 107 this is a 10 gigabit NIC so it's like basically the fastest you can get right now I mean in enterprise you can get 40 gigabit but that's mostly over fiber and most people don't have fiber inside their homes like that I mean they have fiber internet it comes to the box but not inside their homes so AQC 107 and it's N based T NIC Meaning you can do 10 gigabit, 5 gigabit, 2.5 gigabit, and uh, 1 gigabit. And I believe it does 100 megabit, but it won't do 10 or anything like that. Moving on, we have an Intel controller here. This is an i225, and this is a hold itself NIC, so it's separate. It doesn't have a PC. It, I don't believe it uses the PCH uh, as a, with a Mac built into it. I believe it's a standalone NIC. It has an own clock generator and everything in its own BIOS. Um, but that will give you a 2.5 gigabit NIC. So this is a dual NIC motherboard. So you can do two 1 gigabits, fine. You can do one 10 gigabit, you can do one 2.5 gigabit, as long as your router supports it, which much most don't, I mean, but you'll still get it. Anyways, so moving on here, we have our power delivery here. So this is VCSA, like I displayed or uh, explained earlier. And then here, I believe, is VCIO uh, with those tiny little end packs. I don't get it. I'm not going to get into it. Anyways, moving on. Here we have our PCIe hardware. So this is a clock generator. So PCIe 4.0, PCIe 3.0, they have different standards. And in this case, uh, PCIe 4.0 requires a discrete clock generator. We first started seeing these on the first uh, basic, you know, motherboards that had PCIe 4.0, and those were on the AMD side. Now on Intel side, Intel's also using it because, I mean, Usually the PCI controller and the CPU can handle that fine, but in this case, maybe the jitter is too much, something's messed up, and so they have to use these for now. Now, here we have two rows of quick switches, and you're wondering, because I explained earlier, these are just connected to treasure. It goes 16-0 or 8 by 8 for two GPUs, and this is just through the PCH, which is 3.0 on this system. Um, but in this case, uh, for 4.0, you need read drivers, right? So you have two different sets of chips. First, you have read drivers, and then you have switches. Or you have switches and then read drivers. Uh, I couldn't get a magnifying glass to see what the model number is. Anyways, uh, Paracom is in charge of both. And Paracom has a very good reputation for coming out with uh, technology sooner than AS Media, which is what you usually see on cheaper boards. But here we have Paracom, and then I guess AS Media wasn't able to poach enough employees to take over the IP. So here we have PI3 EQX, and they are V drivers. I believe they're down here. And then you have four Paracom, um, where is it? PI3 DBS, which are switches. Now the switches, each one of them, there are four of them, each one can handle by two of PCIe. But in this case, they're all Gen 4. So even with a Gen 3 CPU, it still do Gen 3. Uh, with Gen 4 CPU, you can do Gen 4, you can do Gen 3, depending on what your graphics card supports. And you got the clock generator. You can basically have everything here for full PCI 4.0 support. And then also uh, there are extra switches here, and there are two under here. And uh, so on these boards, the high-end gigabyte boards for this platform, they actually included physical switches instead of just doing it through the firmware through the PCH. So in this case, uh, this slot here, PCI 4.0 directly from the CPU with Rocket Lake CPUs. 
with a Comet Lake, this will be PCI 3.0 to the PCH, but with Comet Lake, or Rocket Lake, it'll switch over to the CPU. Okay? Now let's handle the audio because that's kind of important. Now we have the WEMA capacitors here. These are film capacitors. Did you get that in focus? Yeah. Okay. So we got the WEMA capacitors here. Obviously an ALC1220, that's the basic DAC. So the Azalea codec inside the PCH will output digital audio, render it everything to the uh, basic you know, audio controller, which in this case will turn it into from analog to digital. And then it'll go into a DAC. It also goes through two stages of filters and uh, OPA amp from Texas Instruments. And I believe on the internal, and hold with me now, because this is not the only ALC1220 on this thing. Uh, to begin with, yeah, internally we have an ES, well, an ESS Sabre 9018K2M. And uh, I believe it should be around here. Anyways, so it's around here, and then it outputs these two uh, amplifiers, one per channel. And then uh, we also have a TI chip here. This little TI chip will amplify audio for the amplifier, because the amplifier uses like something like 19 volt or something, above 12 volts, so you need a step-up controller. And this TPS chip from Texas Instruments is specifically designed for it, and Gigabyte is always included when you do high-end audio. They don't really skimp out like that, because I mean, I mean, if you do, it would just not be good. So they basically use it and it supplies over 12 volts for it, but it obviously has to be a way. They separate the PCB through layers. Um, there is a line, right? Yeah, there's a line there. So that, see, that line separates audio uh, signals between analog and digital differences. Uh, so you get uh, digital in and then analog out and then everything separated so the noise does not transfer. Now, the backside. This is the backside amp. Um, it's also from ESS Sabre and it is a... Uh, uh, ESS 9128, okay, this, and on the back of the motherboard here, we get another ALC 1220, okay, and then here, that controls front audio, and then it goes to the DAC, and the DAC makes the audio better, 127, 125, whatever, and it also has auto impedance sensing, so when you plug in your headphones to your front, it'll go up to, like, whatever, uh, I think it's like 600 ohms, and it'll determine between that and lower, uh, I know lower is better for most of you, um, but basically it'll basically detect and set settings correctly to ensure best user quality. Here is your neck amp. This is a depop circuit. So when you boot your computer up, you hear that big pop in the, your speakers, and with this you won't because depop circuit. But when you do boot up your board, you hear some clicking inside. Don't worry. Nothing's going to blow. Anyways, back onto here. So here we have our ECs, uh, not there, uh, there and under one of these slots are embedded controllers. Now they basically help this IT thing here. You on this? Yeah. All right, cool. Sorry. Um, so we got an IT controller here. It's a Super I.O. I believe it's 8686. Yeah, that was right. It's an IT8686 and this should be 8935, something like that. Anyways, so these are your embedded controllers. They control RGB, fan control, and everything like that. Each fan header here, which are here we described earlier, they all um, they have dedicated uh, little controllers next to them to increase current voltage, stuff like that, and also determine what kind of fan you plug in. Um, but also, you can just set that in the BIOS, and you should set that in the BIOS. Um, and then also, if we're dealing with the Super I.O., we should also probably deal with the BIOS ROMs. Um, they're here and here. These BIOS ROMs are 256 megabits, which means they're 32 megabytes. They're very expensive, but to basically when you have so many generations of CPUs on one motherboard or supported by one motherboard, you need to have room for their microcodes because they differ, especially when you change the microcode. And that does happen when you change architecture, and that happened between Comet Lake and then now Rocket Lake. So these support it, and there's two of them. They're redundant. There's a switch to do it, and there's Q-Flash on this motherboard. So you can always flash one or both uh, without having a CPU or DRAM installed. You just need power because there is another embedded controller in this motherboard that controls that separately. Uh, this is a GL Tech. I think it's 805. Um, it basically is a USB 2.0 hub. So you got this little output here. It goes to a breakout cable to USB ports, and there's one on the back for the like next to the I/O. So you have a bunch of stuff. Um, you have a Type C switch for your internal 2x2 uh, USB. Yeah, Realtek. I believe it's an art. Oh, this one. Uh, and then this and a redriver. 
so this is for USB 3.2 and um, yeah it's, it's correctly configured so you get the full thing out of it and also uh, I didn't cover this earlier I should have memory power here is a RT8120D a uh, single phase with integrated driver and it goes out to uh, too low one high configuration for a single phase power output to the DRAM slots. Now that's enough, DDR4 is low power. I know DDR5 is coming out, but I promise you, probably on laptops way before it's on desktops. Um, so yeah, this board has you set and is way more RGB than most people need. But I think these days, uh, might as well have fun instead of warning, right? So, this is the motherboard. It's in its nude. It's very vulnerable right now. And um, I'm going to take care of it because this is one hell of a board. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, please subscribe and all that stuff. And uh, we're going to do a giveaway soon with a big, nice computer. Not this generation. It's going to be X299. Uh, so just keep tuned for that. Anyways, thank you for watching.